Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Xamarin University guest lecture. My name is Rob Gibbons, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all to our third Xamarin University guest lecture of September. I hope everybody is taking advantage of the guest lectures and the lightning lectures that we've been working really hard on for all of you this month. Today, we have Kristen Stutzman joining us to show us how to quickly explore an app concept using Xamarin Forms. Kristen is a developer evangelist here at Xamarin, and I'll let her introduce herself. As always, we encourage you to ask questions, and you can do that in the GoToWebinar uh, control panel. You can ask questions. Uh, I will try to answer some of them, and for others, I'll try to uh, interject and have Kristen answer, and we might leave some to the end to let her answer there as well. But make sure you ask questions if you have any. All right, so Kristen, I'm going to let you go ahead and take it away. Okay, thanks, Rob. Um, so I'm going to be here talking to you guys today about uh, method pro prototyping with Xamarin Forms. So one of the um, definitely really fun uses of Xamarin Forms, we're just going to explore that today. So before we get into that, I'll just quickly um, introduce myself. So my name is um, Kristen Stutzman. I'm a developer evangelist at Xamarin, as Rob just told you guys. Um, what that means is I just kind of get to build apps with Xamarin and use the product and blog about it and kind of just be there for the community. So um, I'll have my contact info on here a couple times for you guys, my Twitter, my email. So if you guys have questions about the talk later or even just need help on something, definitely just feel free to reach out. And just the one little tag about here with me is just I love mobile apps. Um, that's why I'm here. That's why I do this. I taught myself iOS about um, two, three years ago and got into Xamarin about a year and a half ago. Uh, just wanted to get into the cross-platform world. Um, been loving it, of course, enough to come work for them. Um, so I've been enjoying my time here so far. And again, um, just my contact info in case you want to reach out. Um, no rush to write this down right now. It'll be up at the end of my talk as well while, we're, while you guys have a chance to ask some more questions. So um, let's kind of just jump into what we're talking about today. So I'm going to cover um, what wireframes, mockups, and prototypes are first. So wireframes are um, static images, uh, low fidelity. And what that means is um, they're usually black and white, um, maybe some blue for links or, or buttons, something like that. Um, they're really just, this is kind of my favorite part of the design process. Um, it's really just getting all your thoughts out on paper. You can, uh, a lot of people use paper and pencil for wireframes. That's uh, definitely one of the best tools you have. And of course, these are done before mockups and prototypes. They're kind of the first thing that you make and, and they end up being the backbone of your design and how your application is going to be laid out. So just kind of a summary is wireframes are quick to create. You can just draw them on a piece of paper really quick. And because they're the backbone of design, they're kind of used as documentation for the project um, as you go throughout. Um, because, hey, this was our initial thought. Um, let's kind of go back to that and see, see how we've deviated from it and, and stuff like that. So after wireframes, you go ahead and take those wireframes and make them into mockups. So basically this is just adding color, text, images, styles to these um, wireframes so that it looks like a um, draft of the final product basically. Again, these are static, they don't move, they're just images, so you have a different image for each screen. Um, but you want these to be as accurate as possible um, when it comes to representing what the product's going to look like in the end. Um, and just kind of summary, these are, while these take a little bit more time to create than mockups, they're still quicker to create than prototypes, uh, or than uh, wireframes, sorry. So mockups are kind of like the middle thing. Um, we say these are high fidelity, so like I said, um, as accurate as possible when it comes to um, showing the design. And this, these are the most useful for gathering feedback on the design because they, since they are so accurate, um, you can put them in someone's hand and say, hey, these images are what we want these screens to look like in the end. What do you think about it? So then finally, after you've done wireframes and mockups, you make prototypes. And prototypes, um, you, you don't really see them very often. You see wireframes and mockups more often, and I think that's because prototypes are a bit difficult to make um, and take a lot of time, and they're not very straightforward with a lot of the programs that are out right now. Um, so what prototypes are is the difference, the key difference is that they're dynamic. And we say these are like middle fidelity, so they don't have to be completely accurate with colors and fonts and images. 
um, as the mockups do, really they're there to kind of, the key is um, just demo the application, simulate user interaction. Um, and so someone wants to have this prototype in their hand to play with it and see how the app moves around. Um, so that's kind of the key of those. And so, like I said, they, they kind of take a little bit more time to create than the other two, so that and, and, um, makes them costly to create as well. And then, uh, like I said, they act as a preview for the entire application. So you should have one of these in your hand and, and have a good idea of how the application is going to uh, behave. So um, just kind of a quick summary of these. We have uh, wireframe mockup prototypes. The cost obviously increases as we go down. Um, and wireframes, again, are used for documentation, communication. These are black and white, sketched out, sometimes even just on a piece of paper. Mockups are good for gathering feedback or um, getting buy-in if you're, if you're trying to uh, create something and, and need some backing. And these are static, again, um, just kind of a visual representation of what the app's going to look like in the end. And then prototypes are good for user testing. And then um, depending on the prototyping tool you use, you can have uh, these can result in a reusable kind of backbone of the application for you know how it's going to navigate on each screen to each screen and, and stuff like that. And of course these are interactive. That's kind of the key word about prototypes is they need to be able to be played with. They're not just static, they're they're dynamic. So um, now you know about the kind of three design things, and some, sometimes people get confused on the differences of those, so I just wanted to cover those and make sure you know that you're here to make prototypes and you know what prototypes are and, and what those are compared to mockups and wireframes. So, okay, that's cool. So, but now why would we use Xamarin Forms for prototypes? That sorry, I got cut off there. That is, <clears throat> excuse me, so sorry. That's a great question. And so we'll kind of cover that. And what, why, why is Xamarin Forms good for, for prototypes? So the traditional Xamarin approach, you have your shared C-sharp code and your separate UI code. That's all good and fun. But Xamarin Forms, you have a shared C-sharp backend. Then you also have shared UI code. So you get to share more code, and everything is still native. So it's definitely a good tool to be able to prototype, especially if you're asked to make prototypes for more than one um, platform, which usually you would at least be asked to make iOS and Android. So, of course, uh, there's a few reasons. So cost and time. Um, so you have one code base, like I said, for three different platforms. You get to leverage your existing knowledge of XAML and C Sharp. So here's kind of what the where I would say prototypes look like on the right here is you have your shared UI code, which is going to be the majority of your prototypes. And, of course, you have your mock data. So if you want to um, kind of mock out some users or whatever, we'll, we'll show you that later when I do some live coding. And of course, you can reuse this code later. If Xamarin Forms fits the bill for your application, you don't you don't need to rewrite all your views. You just kind of need to clean stuff up and put some uh, business logic in it and stuff like that. Of course, this is a great way to please your stakeholders by using Xamarin Forms because I don't know of any other prototyping tool where you can produce real native applications and put them on physical devices and get that native user experience. So, I mean, I think it's really powerful to be able to create a prototype and put it on, you know, your Android, iOS, and Windows phone and just kind of set them on your boss's or stakeholder's desk or whatever and be like, hey, just play with these and, and let me know what you think. And so I think that's definitely um, a huge perk of, of using this for prototyping. And so, obviously, like I said, you can reuse your code later, so you can turn these prototypes into production by using your existing XAML, throwing in a C-sharp backend, making some web calls, and then, of course, you're resulted with uh, native applications, just as you were when you make prototypes, but they're more functional and um, actually, you know, do what uh, users expect them to do and actually uh, are interactive. So... That's cool, um, but what's included in Xamarin Forms for us to use for prototyping? There's 40, um, more than 40 actually, pages and layouts and controls in Xamarin Forms. Of course, you can build these from code behind or in XAML. XAML seems to be the popular choice, so I'll be demoing everything that I do today in XAML. Then you have um, things like navigation and the animation API, so these are definitely useful for prototyping uh, because you definitely want to show uh, navigating from screen to screen, and then if you need animations for 
moving views around, uh, you have access to those as well. And there's things like data binding, which you can use for your uh, mock data. And dependency service and messaging center, you might you might use those uh, in prototyping, but those are things that are probably um, more useful in an actual production application, but it's still good to know that you can use those if you want to um, reuse all your Xamarin Forms prototyping code and make the actual Xamarin Forms app. So um, if if you're uh, familiar with Windows Phone development, Xamarin Forms is going to feel pretty at home for you because a lot of these pages are, are uh, very familiar. So we have a content page, navigation page, tabbed page, and things like that. Of course, we have our master detail with the slide out menu. Then we have layouts like stack layout, relative, grid, scroll view, these things that, that you've seen in Windows development and that makes sense to be put into mobile um, are all here and available for you. And of course, you can use these in conjunction with each other. So I can have a master detail page with a stack layout and a scroll view inside of my stack layout and so on and so forth. Obviously, you don't want to nest too many things. It might get uh, a little messy, but it's nice to know that you can um, kind of put these things inside of each other. And of course, the controls that Xamarin Forms comes with. Um, so what's cool about these controls is you actually get access to the native control when you use these. So take an entry, for example. An entry in Xamarin Forms is where you um, kind of type some text in. So that's mapped to a UI text field in iOS. It's mapped to an edit text in Android, and it's mapped to a text box in Windows. So you still get access to those native controls when you're um, using these in, in Xamarin Forms. And of course, you see I have this nice little layout here of, of um, controls, but there seems to be something missing in the bottom right corner. And I did that on purpose because um, you actually can make custom controls as well. So um, that's a great thing about Xamarin Forms is if there's a control that you really want to use, um, but it's not available out of the box, well, you can make one custom and by um, kind of overriding one of the things that's already there. So for example, um, one of my colleagues has a um, circle image control, and so um, it just takes the image and kind of puts borders around it, and so that's just easier for you to use circle images throughout your application without um, changing the border radius of them throughout. And so, okay, that's cool with Xamarin Forms and um, everything you can do with it, but let's kind of see what it actually looks like. So here we have like, I don't know, like 15 or so, 20 lines of code, and this gives us um, a lot of stuff. It gives us a tab page with a login and a settings child, and it gives us um, native controls for entries and the login button. And when I talked about the um, two-way binding earlier, you can see here in the um, entry field, I have, it says text binding username and text binding password. So what those are, there's, pro there's properties on the view model that are strings of username and password. And um, when I update those on my view, the view model knows to update the properties on itself. So it kind of binds back and forth. It really allows for separation of concerns, which is definitely ideal in, in any kind of development. Then, of course, I have a binding login command for my button. So it's bound to a command in the view model, which calls a method that says login. And this is great because when I get to this login method, I don't have to um, ask my view what the username and password are. I already have them in my view model. So there's, again, that separation is nice. Then, of course, you can see on the left that um, everything is, you know, looks native because it is. These are native applications. So your tab, um, your tabs are on the bottom for iOS. They're on the top for, oops, I'm jumping ahead. You guys know what's going to happen now. They're on the top uh, for Android and Windows. And then, of course, your entries and your buttons and your font, they all look a little, and feel a little bit different because they're just using the default native uh, fonts and controls for, for these apps. So that's kind of what Xamarin Forms look like. And if you pay attention a second ago when I messed up, you know that now um, I'm going to do a quick demo. So the demo I'm going to do um, for you guys today is I have these three pages and um, I just want to prototype them out so that I can navigate from login to activity feed and then if I were to click on one of the people in activity feed I could go to their profile page. So um, this is the Swarm application. It's basically what replaced Foursquare. So we'll, we'll go ahead and start this and um, I have a little bit of setup that I've done already. I'll kind of walk you through what that was. 
So okay. Here with Xamarin Studio, and I have um, my Swarm prototype application, and um, here's my PCL, which is uh, the, the shared library where I can put my shared views and, and, and models and, and all that. And I'll be doing everything in here today. I won't be doing anything in Android or iOS because everything can actually carry over to uh, both of them. So um, I will go ahead and just kind of show you what I've done. So I have three views here. Um, I have them all open here. They're all empty. Um, I just kind of have them here ready to go. Um, and I'll show you what I do to, to fill those out and we'll quickly prototype out these three pages. And I just kind of want to, I do apologize in, in advance for how much live coding I'm going to do, but uh, I did want to show you uh, how easy and quick it is to make these three pages. So the only other setup I've done is I've come into um, the app.cs file and I've made my main page a navigation page which wraps a login page. And so this navigation page does exactly what you might think it does. Um, it gives me a navigation properties so that I can move throughout my application. And so that way I have those back buttons available to me on iOS and Android. And, um, and, and it logically um, moves through my application from screen to screen and back and forth as well. Okay. So now I have my three, three pages here. Um, so we'll go ahead and just go ahead and get started uh, coding this login page. So I have the, the uh, mock-up pulled up here to the right so you can kind of see as I'm going what, what I'm doing and why and where I'm placing these things. So we'll just kind of imagine that this login uh, mock-up was made for me um, by like a colleague or something and I was asked to create prototypes based on that um, mock-up. So what we're going to do here is your content page has one child and so we're going to choose to do a grid in this page. and we want to add some rows and columns to our grid. So um, again, if you're familiar with um, grid row definition, if you're, sorry, if you're familiar with um, Windows Phone development, this should be uh, right at home for you once again because it's pretty similar, especially for the grids. So we'll say height. For the first one, this login, we'll say the height's going to be like um, 150. And then for the rest, we want we want three, um, four more row definitions. We want one for email, one for password, one for these two login and login and cancel buttons, and then one for this next button down here. So all those are going to be pretty easy because the height we're just going to set it to auto. So It'll just auto size itself so everything fits normally. And I can just copy paste this as I go. Okay, and then the next thing I want is my column definitions. And the reason I want column definitions at all is um, because these two buttons here are in different columns. So they're in the same row in two separate columns. So we'll use our um, columns only in really that area. Um, and then the other, everything else will kind of span over the two columns, and we'll see how that works in a moment. So um, the width for these is going to be this asterisk. And so what that does is, um, whoops, is it fills the screen as much as it possibly can. So in this example, there's two columns next to each other with the width of, the st of an asterisk, and so they're both going to take up half the screen um, next to each other there. So now we can start filling stuff in. So the first thing I want to do is put this label in with login with Foursquare. So label. And again, I'm sorry, I'm just going to kind of read as I'm, as I'm typing to you. I just kind of show you how fast and easy this is. So um, the default, the default uh, grid and column are automatically zero. So we don't have to set either of those here, but we do want to set the column span to two. Um, then we want to set the text to um, that. And then we want the text color to be white, of course. And we want to align the center vertically and horizontally. All right. 
So that label's good to go. Now we'll go ahead and put these two entries in. And so these look kind of like entry cells here, but again, um, the prototypes don't have to be exactly as your app's going to look in the end. Um, if you're going to use Xamarin Forms for your app, though, then it might be uh, worth it to go ahead and just do, look, make it look as close as you possibly can. But we're just going to use entries here um, just for this example. So we want the row to be 1 on this one. And again, the row span, or column span, sorry, it's going to be 2 for pretty much everything except for those buttons. And Ooh. Kristen? Uh, yeah. Uh, Wes pointed out that on line uh, 16 and 19, you have a misspelling of grid, so that's going to give you a problem there. Ah, that's like, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Wes. Okay. Um, now we want to, sorry, I'm lost a little bit. Okay, yeah, we just want to put a, a placeholder here. Username. And then... We can just be lazy and just copy this and paste it right here again. And then, of course, we want the row to be 2 this time and the placeholder to be password. Okay, so we'll look at this. We're already halfway through the login page. Now we just want to add these two buttons. So button, the first one we're going to add is the cancel button. And we want the text to be white. Well, I'll wait for text to be cancel. Text color to be white. Then we want our background color to just be transparent because it's going to be the same as the view behind it. And then we want our border color white. Then we want to set our border radius. Oops, well, we want the width too anyway. We want to set the radius and width because the width is automatically zero. So if you don't set it, then it won't show up. And then the radius, we want to set that because it's like a rounded corner button. So we'll say maybe it's like 15 or so. And then, of course, we want to set a height and width request of this or else it's just going to um, be the size of the text. And obviously that's not um, what the mock-up looks like. So height request. Okay. And again... I'm going to just copy this button and change some stuff for the login. So button text color is going to be the color uh, of our background. And we can't set this to transparent because it won't go all the way through. So we'll actually have to set it to the um, hex of our orange color here. And then our background color wants to be white. Border stuff, all that's good. Everything else should be good. Okay, and then the last thing here is this forgot your password. And so this actually looks like a label, but it's definitely a button because obviously a user is going to click this if they forgot their password. So we're going to use a button, but we're just going to put some properties on it to make it look like a label. And of course, I'm giving these buttons names in case I were to need to um, use them in the code behind to navigate to a different page or pop up something or, or what have you. Oops, I made a mistake here and realized that these buttons um, don't know where they're supposed to be. So grid row equals 3. And grid oh, column is going to automatically be 0, so I don't have to put it on this button. And I keep typing grid wrong. Just like a trend here. And then this one needs to be in the second column, which you know, arrays start at zero, so it's just going to be one. Okay, of course I need to add those here as well. I like to do the grid, grid definitions first, first things first when um, making these, just because so they're all in the same place. It's easier to kind of fix stuff when you when you need to change it. So this one's going to be in the fourth row, and then, of course, we have our column span of two, as we have been doing. Okay, so now we just want to make the text color white, and our text is obviously forgot your password. And then we just want to make the background color transparent, and that'll give us the... Um, 
look and feel of a label rather than a button. So now we should be able to play this. Yeah, I'm silly and don't have Android player running. I do this every time. I know exactly what that is. Okay, so I close my grid and then I put everything on the outside of it. So I just need to move this to the bottom and now I should be good to run. You'd think that if I do it every time I would remember to not do it, but I guess not. And Kristen, uh, Mitch has a question. Why, yeah. are you, why are you using a button for the forgot your password instead of a check checkbox? Is that a design choice or is there a reason why you'd want to use a button over a checkbox? Um, I don't know why you would use a checkbox because I think if you forgot your password, you're going to click it and it's going to pop up some screen like, okay, we'll send you an email or, hey, it'll take you to the web to reset your password or something. So I think you're thinking of remember your password and that would definitely be a checkbox or, or a switch actually in Xamarin Forms. Thanks. Okay, so looks looks pretty similar. Our orange is a little off. Our buttons are kind of wide, but that's all right. Um, so everything's pretty good here on our login page. And so um, let's see if we can try to get this running on an emulator here. Um, but before we do that, let's go ahead and look at our login page's code behind. So when I said we wrapped our login page in a navigation page, um, that gave us the ability to um, do this here which is um, when our login button is clicked, we use our, this navigation property that we have given to us to go ahead and push a new activity feed page. And so that's the next page, which is, I can close this now, and this is the, our, our activity feed page, so we'll be going to that next, and we'll mock that up in just a moment. And let me see if Darren Studio is going to play nice with Android Player, and let me run it. Oh, it is lucky day. It's trying really hard. I'll give it a couple more seconds. And then I can also open this on iOS and kind of show you them side by side and, and how they look different and feel native because they're native. Looks like something's happening with Android. Woohoo! All right. So again, fonts are different. The entries are different. Um, the colors are the same, which is good. That's what we wanted. So um, yeah, we'll just kind of keep those up so we can run those next to each other later once we got the full app um, going. So okay, so this is what our um, activity feed page looks like. So we'll go ahead and start. Um, Instead of a grid, I'm going to use a stack layout for this one because all I'm doing is I'm going to put um, this kind of custom navigation bar on top of a list view. So I don't think there's any need to use a grid in this one. So we'll just go ahead and go for the stack layout. Okay, and then there's some um, properties, of course, I want to set on this. Oh, not on the parent one. Sorry. Okay, so then we've got our stack layout. Um, now we want to make us another stack layout up here. So this is going to be a kind of like a custom navigation bar. And then we'll hide the navigation bar um, in our code behind. I'll show you how to do that just in a moment. So another stack layout. And this one will say orientation. We want it to be horizontal. It's vertical by default. Okay. 
We want it to fill the whole space. And we want the height to be 50 if possible. And then we want to set our background color to that um, nice orange again. So I think that was FF. All right. And last but not least, padding. Of course, I could do padding on platform if I wanted. I'll, I'll show you that on the profile page. Um, but this one, I'm just going to set it the same for, for each. So 10. Oop. OK. Well, Cameron Studios IntelliSense is great when it comes to XAML. But of course, as IntelliSense does, sometimes it blows up on you. OK, so now we're just going to add a couple things in here. We're, I'm not going to worry about this uh, crazy, weird location thing on the side here. So I'm just going to add a label and an image to um, this header thing. So we'll say image. Source is profile.png, and I can show you in a moment that I have um, just a, a placeholder profile image in the resources folder for iOS, and uh, same goes for Android. You have to put it in there separately, um, so that way it'll just kind of pull up this like default anonymous profile picture. And then so, we just so Kristen, sorry that. That brings up a, a question Aaron had that I was waiting to try to interject. You don't have to answer it now if you're going to answer it a little bit later, but uh, related to the profile picture. So that's a piece of data, right? And Aaron's question is, uh, can you speak to the techniques that you would use to mock the data out? Uh, so you're doing prototyping. Where do you get your data? Are there frameworks that you use, or is it pretty much just handcrafted? Are you just going to hard code some data in there? Um, so there might be frameworks you can use, but I have hard coded data, and I will get to that in uh, about... 45 seconds when I make the list view. Uh, so this list view is going to be bound to a, a list of uh, users that I've mocked up. So I'll show you that in just one moment. Thank you Excellent. for a good question, though. That's a really good one. Okay. Image, and then we're just going to quickly make this um, this label, and then I can show you that data stuff. Okay. So we're just going to say kind of two separate labels here because one's bold and one's not, but we'll just make them together. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect. I'm just, okay, uh, text. So font attributes is, we'll make it bold and we'll make the color white. And we want it to make sure that it's um, vertically aligned inside of our, our little header view here. So the next thing we want to make underneath our stack layout is a list view. And so this is going to display all of our data. So the name of this is, we'll just call it list view. Super easy. It's the only one on the page, so that's fine. We want the background color to be white. I think that might be a default, but just in case. And then there's one property we want to set on here, and it has uneven rows. We want that to be true because uh, you see over on the right, that, um, ooh, sorry, that the rows are uneven just in case, um, so this person has lay work as their status, um, but sometimes people don't have status, so it, it uh, may result in the rows being uneven whether they have one or not. Okay, so we'll close our list view. We've got it named there, and we want to put some data in here. But So now we have our list view name, so let's go and look at our code behind for activity feed page. So what I've done here is I have this um, observable collection of users. And if, if we come over here and look in my models folder, I have a user model. And all it is is it's just it's really simple mock data. I'm just passing in a bunch of strings, basically, for, for the data and then assigning it to properties. Um, this is just easier so that you can um, add more users in the list as you go through if um, you, know, you wanted to test your scrolling or whatever. Uh, that way you don't have to add each list item individually, and you can bind to that list instead. So we'll kind of go back to this code behind. So I'm just newing up uh, like six users here, random names, and I did some like lorem ipsum for their description and stuff like that. And then I can uncomment this now, because I have a list view. So then I'm setting my list view's item source to this list of users. 
Um, that's a good, the frameworks question is a, a really good question. I feel like there's got to be some uh, mock frameworks. I know there's like Rhino mock and stuff that I've used in um, .NET, so I'm sure those are available. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I'm sure those are available to us in in Xamarin as well. So I'll definitely um, look at that. That's a great, great, great idea. Okay, and then of course we have our item tapped. Um, so what, this is basically just going to navigate to the next page but we're going to pass our user that we selected to the profile page so that it can um, go ahead and use that to, to bind to some data. So we'll show you that in a bit, but I just wanted to show you kind of how I'm doing the mock data. So let's go back, and so now our list view knows that um, this is our mock data and this is the things that you're binding to. So for every um, user in this list, you need to make a cell. So now we can um, go ahead and kind of uh, give it a data template for the cell. So we'll say, let's do item template, and then inside that, it's data template. I don't know, I'm, I wish I knew why it was so, so deep within here. And then, of course, we can make our view cell. It's just kind of like a custom cell here. And then we want to say view cell view. Okay, and then finally, here's our, here is our empty cell we've got. So I'm going to uh, make a grid. Uh, for this one because I want, I basically want um, four rows for each of these um, possible labels and then I want three columns, one for the image, one for the labels in the middle and one for the uh, labels on the right. So let's go out here, so I'll go ahead and make this grid and All right, then we'll make our four rows, and they're all going to be of an auto height because, like I said, sometimes those uh, labels won't just won't be there or will be bigger or whatever, so we just you know, let it size itself. That's what grids are for. Um, and then we want to do column. Now we want three of these, and then the width is going to be auto for two of them, but for the middle one, we'll make it an asterisk, so that way this middle will uh, be as large as it can, and it'll push everything out to the sides. So we'll just change this to an asterisk, and we should be good to go. And we're going to put everything inside the grid this time. Okay, so then we want a few things. We want quite a few labels, and the first thing we we want is an image. Uh, this image, I'm again just going to use the profile placeholder. Um, so we'll say then we want to do um, a row span on this. So grid row span. So this one has pretty much its own column but it wants to take up all the rows. So there's four rows. So we'll say row span four. And then we want to do a height and width request, we'll say of 50 for this guy. Okay, now we want to add these four labels we have here. So we have a name label, um, it looks like the, a check-in label, location, and all that stuff. So. We'll say a label. Um, so this one's going to be cool. Oh, first we're going to set the grid data because I always like to do that first. So column is going to be one here because it's in the second one there in the middle. And the row is going to be zero, so we don't need to set that. Um, so the text for this one is going to be, since we know that this cell is mapped to a user item, we can use binding here. So binding name with the user. And then we want to make the text black and maybe bold. And then we'll set the font size so it's not too big. That's kind of little up there. Okay. Now we can kind of just be lazy again and copy this label and change some, some properties for the next one. So still column one, row is going to be one, 
And then this one is, we're making this like assembly 3.0 as an example label here. So this is going to be um, bound to the last check-in of that user. The text color, we want to be our um, apps color. So we'll say FF A7. And we don't need it to be bold, so we could take that out. Whoa. And we want this to be a bigger font, so we'll say maybe 20. Okay, again, we can just paste the label and change some stuff. The row is going to be two this time. Now, this one's going to be bound to their location. See San Francisco, Czech Republic. And we want the text color of this to be gray. Not bold. 12 is good. It's about the same size as the name one. Now, last, the last uh, label in this column it's going to be their status. And like you see, only one person on the screen has status. So that's where the uneven rows comes in. And then the bindings, the status, as I said. Uh, black is good for this one. We'll make the text size a little bit bigger. 15 here. And that's, that's good for our um, second column. Now, our third column, we want this like kind of heart symbol and this seven minutes, um, but it's really, really annoying to try to find this heart symbol. So I'm just going to cheat and grab these two labels from my GitHub. This completed project is on my GitHub. So uh, GitHub is official Kristen. Um, that'll be up again at the end of my talk. But, um, oops, I don't want PowerPoint. But yeah, every, the completed project's up there, so if you want to kind of have an example of prototypes and how I mock my data out and stuff, you can definitely go look at that. So um, so the only thing that's different about these labels is we've set a row span, which you haven't seen me do yet. But the reason I did that is because if we look over here, there's four rows, but there's only two labels on the right side. So we want them each to span two rows so that they take up kind of half, half the, the cell there. Okay, so we should be good to go on this page. Um, I'll just run it on one platform. I'm already on Android, so we'll just try Android really quick. And then once we get the profile page up and running, I'll, I'll run both applications side by side, and we can kind of see the differences. So if I click login, so it looks like there's some weird spacing here, but it looks like it's working okay. Or maybe we're missing some. No, it's just these cells are really big. That's all. Okay, let's see how that looks on iOS. Make sure I didn't mess anything up. So if the spacing's wrong on iOS, too, we know something went... Probably wrong. Looks it looks okay. It looks like we're um, missing some information. Maybe um, we have their location. Oh, I bet you I spelled status wrong or something. Last check in spelled that wrong. There's the error. Okay, so we should be good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just leave that. Um, I know that was my mistake. So we'll just go to on the profile page and we'll show the whole app as as I finish you up here. So we can close this mock up and here's our profile page mock up. Um, so we can go ahead and go through this. So for the profile page, um, the one child I'm going to use is a scroll view because it seems uh, like you might want to scroll and look, look at some stuff on the bottom there. Plus we don't know what our device size is so we don't know if everything's going to fit. Um, so here's where I'm going to show you the kind of um, the padding on platform. So we'll say So you have this padding, and then inside of here you can say um, on platform. And then you have to specify type arguments, and so ours are thickness here. So that's the um, thickness. Can't spell that wrong. So that's how you uh, do padding. It's just a, it's just thickness, and then we can of course say iOS.
and then Android. So you just specify them all here. I'm not running on Windows, but it it um, because I'm on Mac, but uh, it makes you kind of put them in here anyway. So. And plus, I would like to be able to run on Windows eventually, so all I'd have to do is open this in Visual Studio, and, and I'd be good to go. So, okay, there's my padding for my scroll view. Um, the, then I'm going to use a stack layout for this. Um, may, maybe I should have used a grid in this situation, um, but it, it's really up to you. It just depends on, on um, how the stack layout's performing for you and, and stuff like that. It just really is a personal choice. So you could have done either one. So a stack layout. And then well, we want the padding to be 10, so we want everything to um, kind of touch the edges of our screen. And then we want the, sorry, lost a little bit, horizontal options. That's what the next thing we want is to be center. So everything that we want in there to be kind of centered right in the middle, like our text and all that. So I don't want to code a bunch of images and labels and buttons for you again. So I'm just going to pull this. Actually, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to revert this. And then we'll just kind of walk through the profile page. Because all I'm doing is I, I would just be coding a bunch of labels and buttons for you um, over and over. So we have our scroll view. We have the padding that I showed you a moment ago. We have our stack layout, and then we just got an image for the, the profile image, again, it's right, right here in the center, and a bunch of labels. And then, so what I'm doing with these labels is I'm binding to the properties on that user object again. Um, so last scene, I just, I just had that to be a static thing. Um, I bound to the description, and then these, I made a new stack layout horizontally for these buttons and put them next to each other. And then again, a new stack layout for the friends and photos little chunks of square here, and put those next to each other as well. Um, so that's pretty straightforward, but we can kind of look at the profile page to see um, how it knows to bind to the username and stuff like that. So I don't have a, like a view model or anything for this, so all I do is this user that I got passed in, I set the binding context of this page to that user. And then the other thing I'm doing, I can go, we're done with Doing that. The other thing I'm doing in here is um, saying I'm adding a, an item to the, the toolbar, which is just the, the top um, navigation kind of bar. And it's just a, a button that says contact. Um, so I guess we kind of need this. So I guess this is just this button. And um, all I'm doing is kind of uh, displaying an alert that says, okay, you clicked the contact button. Um, I, I didn't want to knock up a whole new page for that. And I wanted to kind of show you that what display alert does and, and how it um, works separately on all, all the platforms. So let's see if we can build. I think I saw some error in here. Hopefully that just goes away. Okay, it's fake. Okay, so now we'll try to run this on iOS and Android after, of course. Okay, got that on there. And I'll just do Droid right away. so that we can have them sitting next to each other. So here's our login screen, so we click login, go to the next page, that looks much better with the statuses there and, and the uh, last check-in in the, in the orange. So we can click one of these items and it of course moves over to the um, contact page. The the back button looks different on, on Android, it's default uh, to have your, your app icon up there with it, then we could click contact and it would say this in Android, and it would look like this in iOS. Uh, so I'm on the iOS 9 simulator, so we got those new rounded corners on here. Um, so it looks, it looks native, it's using those native alert views. And then um, this is kind of just a really, really super simple version of, of the profile page. I could have added a list view down here and um, bound it to kind of events that, that the user was going to or, or has been to or, or whatever in there and then of course I can go back and uh, you see I, I don't have a way to go back from this page but that makes sense because I got here from the login page uh, so I can kind of just quickly show you how I did that and all it is actually super easy um, you just have this uh, 
set has navigation bar. And then that's, oh, this is now, this is, uh, well, either way. You hide the navigation bar completely, or you can actually say um, that it can go back, and then it, it won't be allowed to go back. But, uh, yeah, I just hit it completely for both those pages because I rolled my own navigation bar for the activity page, and then login page obviously doesn't need a navigation bar. So uh, that's it, and that's kind of how quickly, quick and easy it is to create prototypes in Xamarin Forms. And again, you have this uh, XAML code that you can, of course, uh, reuse uh, with, with, when making this application uh, in production. So it's very useful and um, definitely not the only thing Xamarin Forms is useful for, but um, definitely one of the, the key things and definitely a, a, a kind of differentiator for it. So if anyone um, has questions, I would love to take them. I can find the... Great, yeah, so uh, lots of people had questions during the, the presentation. I answered some of them, I gave you some of them, uh, but if you have any more, anyone, please uh, put it in now before uh, we finish up. Uh, Kirsten would be uh, happy to answer those for you. But uh, if nobody has any questions, I wanna say thank you so much, uh, Kirsten. Great presentation, great to know how we can uh, quickly and easily uh, prototype our apps using Xamarin uh, Xamarin Forms. So Mark has a question. Are we going to have a link to the source code? Uh, so are you going to share this, Kristen? We can. Uh, yeah, I can. Okay. Can I just put it in the window? Uh, actually, we will. When we take this recording, we put it up on our guest lecture uh, link up on the website. There will be a download for the materials there. So you oh, perfect. The materials, okay. and we'll get it up there for everyone to be able to have them. Okay. Cool. Uh, in including people who weren't able to make it to the uh, session today. So we'll get that up there. All right, so like I said, great presentation, L love it. And for everyone else, remember that these guest lectures are recorded, like I just uh, mentioned. They are exclusively exclusively available to you guys, to you uh, Xamarin University subscribers and students. We're gonna have it up in the next few days. We'll have a link to all those materials. And remember that our next lecture in the series is gonna be next Tuesday, so not Thursday, but Tuesday. Uh, again, at 8 a.m. Pacific time or 3 p.m. GMT time. And that's going to be Greg Shackles, who's going to share his vast knowledge and experience in developing and testing Xamarin apps. Uh, Chris does have a question. Is there any type of sketch tool that will let you wireframe or mock up an app using controls from Xamarin Forms? Um, no, there's not one that um, will be specifically um, controls from Xamarin Forms. But for wireframes and mockups, I use a program called Sketch. Um, and that is an awesome program. It comes with a lot of stuff out of the box. So um, this, if I can go back to my, uh, oh, if I can go back to my wireframe slide. So I made this mock-up and this wireframe in Sketch. And so it kind of comes with a default, like uh, hold this on. So iPhone. Kirsten, make sure you're sharing your screen, because right now we still see the thanks question screen. Oh, I paused it. Okay, yep. okay. Can there you see you. this okay. now? Yes. Yeah, so um, the mock-up here, uh, I'm a mess, okay. The wireframe here, and then the mock-up on the next page were both made with a program called Sketch. Um, it's from the Mac App Store. Um, and they have a lot of, like, table. you can just drag and drop, like, a table view or buttons for iOS, and then they have Android as well. Um, so that's what I would recommend for mock-ups and prototype or mock-ups and wireframes but nothing for specific uh, Xamarin Forms controls. Well, and we have to remember as well, Xamarin Forms doesn't actually have its own controls. What it does is it renders using the native controls. So any kind of sketch tool that you're going to use, you can design your iOS uh, UI and you can design your uh, Android UI and you're going to be using the native controls, the buttons, the labels, things like that. Regardless of how you code it with Xamarin Forms using the abstraction, it's going to render using the native controls. So uh, any of those tools should be able to work. All right. Um, yeah, so uh, Mitch has a great point here. Also related to the wireframe question, uh, not a live wireframe, but he likes using prototyping on paper. Uh, absolutely. So one of the things I've done before, and uh, I mentioned this in one of the classes, is I just get a little block of wood that's about the size of uh, a phone or a tablet or whatever else and just tape a piece of paper to it and draw on it. That gives you a very, very quick turnaround time to explore some 
uh, design ideas and see, you know, can you touch all the different elements? Uh, how does it feel actually in your hand? And you don't have to spend a lot of time on the computer, which takes longer. You can just quickly draw it out uh, and hand it to someone, which is another great thing to do as well. Uh, and, and Chris follows up, says, what would be nice is a tool like Sketch, but that lets you use Xamarin Forms controls and then choose the platform to render for. So exactly what you're basically looking for is the Xamarin Forms designer, which we hear a lot. People really want. Um, we don't have one yet, obviously. Uh, I don't know if we're working on one or not, but that would be nice. We know lots of people want that. All right. Uh, so again, if you have any questions, get them in. But so we're getting close to uh, the end of the hour. So I want to say once again, thank you for everyone for attending. Thank you once again to Kristen for all the, the effort getting this together and sharing it all with us. Uh, so that brings us to the end of our guest lecture. And we'll see you all in class coming up. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, guys.